speakers and uh, our uh, co-chairs will join through yeah. this uh, Zoom link, but we are going to uh, disseminate uh, this uh, program through our Facebook page. So okay. you know, we want to give a, you know, bigger audience to hear about our discussion. Right. So how, how many have registered? If they have registered, or are you just going to put it out in Facebook? Usually live, uh, when we uh, disseminate our program through Facebook page, we found that around you know, uh, 500 to 1,000 people join. Okay. But uh, you know, as uh, we also put this all video in our Facebook page as well as our website, so later on people can also see this uh, uh, program. So uh, uh, Professor Udu Chaudhary, he is uh, one of the, our key uh, uh, cardiologists in our uh, country. And mm -hmm. he is also a person who is uh, interested and do lots of research activities. You may have heard that you know, Eminence is now uh, 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 conducting a research uh, for the COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. Um, uh, which is, uh, you know, implemented by the World Heart Federation. And uh, Professor Odu Chaudhary is one of our key, uh, you know, investigator for the study. Right. Thank you. Actually, I'm one of the PIs of the study. In fact, we initiated that study from World Heart Federation. So Bangladesh has done well, at least. I mean, eminence, all the data that we have got is very good. And... Um, there's been no problem. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for uh, participating in the study. It's my pleasure, actually. Uh, okay. uh, if you want to have an effective strategy in tackling the situation, you need proper data. Right. But for yeah. that, nothing can substitute uh, proper collection of inf accurate information. Hi, Amit. Hello. Hi. Hi, Prabhakar. Hi, everybody. Hi, Amitabh. This is uh, Dr. Samim from Eminem. Hello. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Thank you for joining with us. Hey, you're very welcome. Hi, Professor Fasto. This is Shamim from uh, Eminence. Hi. I'm sorry. I had a little problem here with the, with the connection, but um, I think I'm still on well, one minute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Professor Fasto, let me introduce uh, with our team. Uh, uh, today, uh, we have uh, got Professor Odo Chaudhary. Uh, he is a renowned cardiologist in Bangladesh and he is leading cardiology department in Dhaka Medical College. As well as, um, uh, as you know, that Eminence is uh, coordinating a research project which is implemented by the World Heart Federation, this COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. And Professor Odo Chaudhary actually leading that uh, 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 research in Bangladesh and he's taking lead one of our site among the three sites. And he has keen interest to conduct a different type of research in our country as well as medical education on the cardiology too. Uh, he do lots of works in, in these areas. Uh, so our intention to organize this um, uh, uh, webinar, how we can you know, develop a strong partnership uh, uh, to conduct the research uh, uh, in the you know, cardiology sector as well as uh, development of the education for cardiology. So uh, 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 we also have Professor Shamunashan with us uh, and uh, uh, Professor Prabhakaran as well as uh, Amitabh with us. So if you uh, permit me, then uh, I can start uh, the, of the webinar. So before starting, I'm just going to uh, uh, give you an introduction that how we are going to conduct this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, I will introduce all of you. Uh, then uh, I will give uh, the first to give the welcome uh, speech by the Professor Fausto Pinto, then uh, Professor Shamunarishan. Uh, then uh, I will request uh, 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 Amitabh uh, uh, Banerjee to give his uh, 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 presentation, then Professor Odu Chaudhary, then uh, we'll ask uh, uh, Prabhakaran to uh, uh, give his speech, uh, then Professor Rubed Amin, then finally remarks will be carried out by the uh, Professor Shamuni uh, Fausto Pinto. Is it okay? Sure, no problem. 
Just to just to check, Shamin, how how long do you still want um, me to talk for twelve minutes? Do you want it shorter? I, yeah, I can but, fit to what you need. Yeah, but, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the first, uh, like you know, uh, your presentation, uh, Professor Adu Choudhury, uh, and uh, Professor Koron and Robert Amin will talk uh, uh, twelve minutes each. Uh, then we'll discuss, uh, uh, come to Professor Shamunushan and Professor uh, Fausto Pinto to give their final recommendation. Dear colleagues and audience, uh, this is a virtual room. And those who are watching us, uh, I'm pleased to welcome you all to this exclusive discussion on global cardiovascular health and technology jointly organized by the Eminence and World Heart Federation. Uh, the discussion is co-chaired by the Professor Fausto Pinto and Professor Shamunation. Uh, Professor Fausto Pinto, you all know him. He's uh, uh, president of World Heart Federation. And Professor Shamunation, he is also president of Bangladesh Non-Communicable Disease Forum, as well as uh, executive committee member of Eminence. And he was also ex-director general of health services in Bangladesh too. Uh, however, keeping my remarks brief since we are a, here to listen to our remarkable panelists uh, with whom we are really delighted to share this platform. I would like to request uh, Professor Shamunyashan to give a welcome speech, uh, speech on behalf of Bangladesh uh, Non-Communicable Disease Forum and Eminence. Professor Shamunyashan. Thank you, Shamin. Um, thank you for inviting me in this very I think it, it should be a very learning platform for viewers about this uh, non-communicable disease, particularly the problems in the cardiovascular diseases. <clears throat> uh, as we would all know that uh, the, the global scenario is changing from um, communicable disease to non-communicable disease. Similarly, like Bangladesh also, we have a lot shifting of the disease port portfolio and disease pattern. And, but for the last one and a half years, of course, the situation is quite different because of this COVID outbreak and COVID pandemic. Of course, the difference is different, but we had a very big challenge during this COVID pandemic to manage this non-communicable disease uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in our hospital situations as well as as a whole total uh, health service management situations. I'm sure not only in Bangladesh, in other countries also, particularly uh, the little developing countries and less developing countries are, are really suffering most in, in providing this healthcare during these pandemic regions. The developed countries, they have also problem with the pandemic, but they are doing little better than the for supporting the non-communicable diseases. Uh, the eminence is, uh, is a non-government organization, but doing a lot of research work and study. Uh, and they are also the, uh, in, in involved in the uh, World Health Federation and others non-communicable disease forum. Uh, and they are doing a number of research. And I'm sure uh, further opportunities for doing research along with this uh, World Health Federation and um, Eminence will be doing very effectively, efficiently and effectively, I must say. So you know, that will give uh, a good opportunity. This today's platform, of course, I, I, the, I'm just welcoming you all because uh, I'm very much eager to learn from you. And finally, I'll come back to the uh, concluding remarks. Uh, but um, as a public health expert, uh, I was working in the, in the government for around 40 years uh, and, and found the real challenges in public sectors in providing these uh, non-communicable disease services. Uh, and I'm sure you will agree with me that uh, particularly we have big examples in India as well as in Bangladesh also, the uh, and the private sectors are doing very well uh, compared to the public sectors in, in normal time. But now in, in these situations that we have to work very hard uh, to have in public and private sector mixed up because 
uh, I'm not from Bangladesh experience during this pandemic situation. I think he has lost the connectivity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll come back to him if, if we can manage the time. So now I'd like to request uh, uh, our another co chair, uh, Professor Fausto Pinto, President of the World Heart Federation and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Lisbon, uh, to give his welcome speech. Professor Fausto. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me and for WHF uh, to be here with you, with the eminence. I want, first of all, to bring the greetings of uh, the World Heart Federation uh, to eminence and recognize the excellent work that uh, you are doing and uh, all uh, the different activities that uh, you've developed over, um, over, over time and the uh, uh, dedication to um, improving uh, cardiovascular health or health as, uh, uh, as a whole uh, and uh, particularly in, uh, in Bangladesh, but also uh, these topics are very relevant in a, in a more global perspective. The World Heart Federation is a global organization. Um, it includes scientific societies, foundations, patient organizations. It's a very global uh, platform. I usually compare it to the UN for cardiovascular issues. Our vision is cardiovascular health for everyone, which of course is very ambitious, as we all know particularly considering that uh, uh, cardiovascular disease still represents the number one cause of mortality and morbidity at the global level, despite the pandemic that was terrible and is still ongoing, but cardiovascular disease still remains the number one cause of death and uh, morbidity across the world. And uh, in the pandemic, as we all know, cardiovascular disease was actually one of uh, uh, the conditions that uh, was more, or patients with cardiovascular disease that were more affected and, uh, and also was one of the consequences of, uh, uh, of this pandemic, directly or indirectly. So it's very important that uh, we uh, continue to discuss topics around how to tackle, how to address uh, cardiovascular disease, how to improve not only the way that uh, we tackle disease, but also very importantly to work in the prevention side and uh, to be able to improve the health of our citizens, of our communities, and that works through prevention, through adopting measures uh, that can help uh, to improve cardiovascular health. Uh, on the other hand, we as uh, WHF, we are based in, in, in Geneva, as, uh, as we know, as you all know, and uh, we have close links with WHO. We are actually the official representative for cardiovascular diseases uh, uh, to WHO. So we work very closely trying again, to use our influence to improve the awareness on cardiovascular issues, because we believe only knowing the problems, we can tackle them and find the best solutions uh, to address these different uh, problems and these different conditions that we are um, uh, facing and uh, unfortunately still in a very heavy way. As you know, there is the global uh, um, goal from WHO, uh, one of uh, the SDGs of WHO for 2030 to reduce uh, on one third premature death due to cardiovascular disease is a very ambitious uh, goal, is a very ambitious uh, objective, but we are all working and I know that together with you, with Aminus, uh, I'm sure that uh, we will be able to at least add a little bit more to improve the way we can uh, address uh, these different issues. And I'm sure that uh, today during the webinar, uh, we'll be able to look at least to some of these uh, conditions, some of these problems, some of the solutions as well. We are very much looking for solutions, identify the problems and try to find solutions, which are not easy, as we all know. If it was easy, it, it would have been fixed a long time ago, but it's not easy. And it only works if we work together. And that's why I think it's so important that we continue to have and we uh, not, not only uh, develop and organize, but stimulate this type of exchange because we believe that only working together at the global level, we can achieve our goals of cardiovascular health for everyone. So thank you so much again for the invitation for WHF to be here with you today. We have two of our uh, eminent uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Prabhaka, who is the chair of our science committee at the WHF, which is very well known of all of you, as well as Dr. Amita uh, Banerjee, uh, who is uh, uh, responsible for a a very nice program that we have at WHF, which is the Emerging Leaders uh, Program, 
he was an emerging leader now he emerged already so he's a leader now uh, but he was part of that program which i know that some colleagues from bangladesh have been involved with and uh, uh, and he's going to be also one of uh, our speakers today and he's very much involved uh, with WHF. so this uh, i hope uh, will be a contribution for of WHF again to improve cardiovascular health and to improve the way that, that we are dealing with all these issues so thank you so much and i'll uh, give the word back to you uh, thank you professor fasto uh, uh, we really appreciate for your time and engage with us uh, um, as i mentioned earlier that you know we have an objective uh, to learn from you as well as uh, our friend from provoker uh, i think that you know uh, cardiovascular disease is one of the our major challenges in bangladesh and uh, we like to uh, develop a strong partnership with you uh, 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 as well as other you know stakeholders um, who has uh, you know uh, uh, high technology and knowledge uh, that can help us to uh, manage uh, this uh, cardiovascular related problem in our country so before i go to uh, uh, amita banerji I, I like to ask a uh, professor shamunushan uh, do you like to conclude your uh, uh, talk as you were disconnected that time professor shamunushan i think that you know uh, 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 he may be uh, come back later on uh, during our concluding of the session uh, so now uh, uh, dr amita banerji who is a world heart federation emerging leader senior advisor uh, university college of london uh, and he's going to talk about the digital health intervention in cardiovascular disease hope and hype amita banerji thank you very much um for the invitation and, and uh, thank you very much um shamim and colleagues um so my name is amitabh banerji i'm a, a, a cardiologist and an academic at university college london uh i'm um, i'm still very much in in gestation still emerging counter to what professor pinto said but i'm going to be talking about uh digital health interventions uh hope or hype my conflicts are i'm a trustee of the south asian health foundation in the uk which is um looking to alleviate uh, health inequalities related to ethnicity in the uk i'm also a senior advisor to the emerging leaders program which professor pinto mentioned and i have um received research grants from astrazeneca unrelated to the topic of this talk the issue of hype in digital health in particular is one we should around the world be concerned with and this is this is the the poster child of what this is the poster child of why this is elizabeth holmes she was previously the the richest um lady in the world uh, she founded theranos she was known as the steve jobs of of uh, of the the female gender and she had based her company on min- miniaturized technology for um blood investigations which was said to be digital this was um approved by fda and at one stage it was approved by our regulators in um the uk nice and europe as well and it was only later that it came to be known that this this was flawed it was fraudulent the technology had been hyped massively and wasn't what it was thought to be and this this company has collapsed now but it's a, a a salutary lesson that we must be aware of not being duped by hype that we need to follow evidence if you look at one part of cardiovascular disease coronary heart disease the mortality has been thankfully the, the the rate has been dropping for several decades and the advances have been many uh you know whether it is uh early identification of risk factors beta blockers statins whether it's on the interventional side angioplasty bypass surgery but i show this graph to show that 
any advances that digital health have on cardio uh, has uh, have on any digital single digital intervention has on cardiovascular disease has to be in the context of other advances and will be incremental. So when we read headlines that digital healthcare is going to revolutionize or digital healthcare is going to be a game changer or digital healthcare is going to cut mortality, we need to know what the absolute impact is. And it's important to know what we're talking about. Digital health, digital technology, are quite vague, loose definitions. At best, you might say that um, digital health involves anything from electronic health records and electronic health records research to M health, which is the use of mobile phones, e health, which is more electronic devices from uh, internet to smartphone, in, sorry, internet access by a smartphone or by your personal computer. Digital technology is beyond that. And it's wrong to say that digital technology has, is only something of the last decade or so, because whether you look at pacemakers or many of the other uh, innovations that have been in cardiology and cardiovascular medicine for some time, they do involve digital technology. I've listed a few other terms which are relevant to the discussion, which I won't list all of them, but informatics is related because it's the study of information and information flows. Data science is how those numbers are crunched is, and, and, and used. Machine learning is often talked about. That is a form of artificial intelligence where algorithms are processing data and then personalized and precision medicine are often quoted as applications of digital medicine. Wearables and sensors are examples of digital technology, which you use. So these are all terms that I put up there to say that people use all kinds of terms when they're talking about digital health. And many other um, investigators and clinicians have, have looked at the wide implications of digital health. This is from an, a, a seminal uh, review by Rumsfeld in uh, Nature Cardiology Reviews, where on the left, you've got the different types of data sources from administrative records, electronic health records, patient reported outcomes, medical imaging, biomarkers. And then with that data, one of the applications, the major applications of digital health is that we, we are able to analyze it more quickly, more effectively, and more multimodally than ever before using machine learning and other techniques. And the applications of this are important. We can do everything from individual level prediction of risk to population level management. There are applications for precision medicine and there are applications for public health. But unless we are measuring and shown to be improving cardiovascular outcomes, then this is still a speculative use. In digital health, there's um, something known as the learning system, learning health system. And the reason this term comes about is that we have wastage throughout. So we have science and scientific insights, some of which get into guidelines and used as evidence. And some of those are used in actual day-to-day -day clinical care. The learning health system tries to reduce that wastage. One of the ways in it does that is to have electronic health records and data that is used throughout those three um, silos, if you like, so that the questions for the science are coming directly from the clinical coalface. We have done a recent systematic review in cardiovascular disease of an application of digital health, machine learning, for both de definition of subtypes or clusters and for prediction of risk. And there's been a lot published in this space. But what we showed here is if you look at the blue, the red, and the green, there are three steps. The development of algorithms, the red is the validation of those algorithms, the green is implementation in clinical care. And 
very few studies to date of machine learning have done the validation part externally in another data set. And very few have looked at clinically implementing. That's why till date, despite all of the money and, and noise about machine learning, we haven't seen it in healthcare yet. We haven't done the right kind of studies yet. Uh, this is just to show the same thing. You can see at the far right, there's no studies to date of real world effectiveness or cost effectiveness of the application of machine learning in cardiovascular disease. If you look at the evidence, well, in order to put evidence into practice, you need us, the workers, to be aware of it. We know that in the UK, health informatics and digital health has, has been um, a Cinderella at the ball. It's been a poor relation. It's, it's relatively neglected in the curriculum. We've released a new course uh, in the last couple of years at University College London called Doctor as Data Scientist so that all medical students have access to these themes. And we also know that in postgraduate training, regardless of whether you're a physician, a surgeon or a general practitioner, your um, competencies don't necessarily incorporate this. And the reason that we need to incorporate this is so that we can evaluate these um, technologies for our patients. In the UK, in the same way as you have guidelines for drugs and medical devices, there have been the start of, of the process of trying to develop standards and uh, guidelines for digital health technologies, but this is still relatively early in the process. I will quickly mention the largest study to date of a, a trial of uh, the Apple Watch. This is the one of the largest cardiovascular trials ever done and it's the largest digital health trial ever done in cardiology. So uh, a wearable, the Apple Watch was, was used here to assess whether it could pick up uh, atrial fibrillation, the commonest heart rhythm disorder, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I mention it because it shows that even in this reputable journal, even with one of the biggest companies in the world, even with such high numbers, when you look at the figure one of the of the study, you can see that 400 odd thousand people were recruited, but actually at every stage, there was a, a huge dropout. And in simple analytic terms, when they've quoted the percentages at each stage in this paper, and you can go back and look at this paper, rather than going back and using this as the denominator, the total population, they have very cleverly used 945 divided by 2,161. So it's looking like this is much more than it should be. This 945 should be over there. So there is a big reporting bias and inaccuracies, which we have to be aware of. This is where we have to be wary of hype. And you, you, can, you can read through, but the, the number of people out of those 400,000 who actually completed follow-up is... Is, is, is 396, not even 400. So, so this is not as powerful a study, yet it grabbed all the headlines at the time. We have um, developed a, a resource called Catalog of Bias, where we talk about um, biases in evidence-based healthcare, including in digital healthcare, which may be of interest to listeners. Final few slides here, that, so, so the one thing both in the UK and globally we need to be aware of is that there are health inequalities and there is inequalities in digital literacy and access to digital health. So whatever technology we have should not exacerbate those inequalities. That's what's known as the digital divide. At the moment, we have a data divide. We know that. For example, in terms of genomic studies done around the world, this is now five years old, but it's not terribly different from then that you can see that uh, nearly all the genetic studies done around the world have excluded the um, non-Caucasian populations and so are not necessarily applicable to most of the world. We talk a lot about data-driven and technology-driven and digital technology-driven. The reality is that we have specialists, whether that's clinicians or researchers, and data sitting in the driving seat 
And if we're lucky, the patients and the public are sitting in the passenger seat and often they're sitting in the kiddie seat at the back. We need to be much more in the position where the patients and public are driving and the specialists and the data are the engine or the navigation system. So to finish, the, the need here is that we need to think about how we learn in our health systems using data. We need better guidelines and training, more studies of effectiveness and cost effectiveness, better guidelines, more user-centered design, and more learning from other areas. We have a long history of regulation in drugs and devices. We should think about the areas of overlap with digital technology rather than trying to make new regulatory procedures. So the real problem is not whether machines think, but whether men do. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Amitabh Banerjee, uh, for your nice presentation and uh, share with us your views related to the digital health intervention in cardiovascular disease. Uh, I think this, you know, uh, during this COVID-19, we have also the same experience uh, that it is important to generate data properly, as well as, you know, preserve the data may be effective if you can use the digital system. I think from your presentation, our audience will be encouraged to uh, 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 engage with the digital system for the cardiovascular disease. Um, uh, I'd like to share with you that uh, Professor Dr. Rubed Amin, Line Director, Non-Communicable Disease Control Program, Director General Health Service, Minister of Health and Family Welfare of Bangladesh, joined with us. He's our main you know, driver uh, for uh, non-communicable disease in our uh, country. So welcome, uh, Dr. Rubed Amin. Now uh, we'll go to learn uh, from Professor Dr. Uh, Abdul Wadud Choudhury. He's uh, uh, head of the Department of Cardiology, Dhaka Medical College Hospital, Clinical and Interventional Cardiologist, Bangladesh Specialized Hospital, and he's our, one of our uh, PI for World Heart Federation study. Uh, Professor Dr. Wadud Choudhury, sir. Thank you, Shami, for uh, allowing me to, to talk something which is my passion, teaching. I'm a teacher. And today's topic is use of digital technology, what is happening in cardiovascular teaching in Bangladesh. You know, in this COVID-19 pandemic, it has caused a major disruption of traditional face-to-face -face teaching and learning throughout the world. Pandemic affects the medical education and postgraduate medical training in many ways. There's difficulty in conducting formal in training, also examinations. There is a decreased number of clinical cases related to different specialties. Also, there is tough shortages. However, most medical institutes across the world have started to rapidly convert their curriculum from face-to-face -to, -face to online delivery system. They're using different options like Zoom, Google Classroom, different apps, etc. But we should remember that it is very important to continue and maintain a high quality online teaching and learning, considering the context and challenges of each country. What about the global scenario of medical education? The US experiences say uh, medical education in many institutions, they experienced the abrupt disruption when it started in the face of COVID-19 pandemic because of the rapidly expanding uh, number of patients who are very infectious. Initially, there was shortage of PPE, and there was growing concern for exposure to asymptomatic carriers. The preclinical curriculum was migrated online with evidence of similar or improved learning compared to prior years. That's a good news because the students are responding quite nicely. However, students on hospital rotations, they completed virtual classroom, not the actual clinical classroom, and clinical skill assessment, and they also participated in newly created online electives. Large-scale adoption of online education in USA has shown that it is possible to achieve a number of teaching objectives virtually. And we should remember, given the present situation, a return to a typical pre-COVID-19 teaching platform is very unlikely in future. There will be in-person training, in close contact training, but not the previous type of training will be available. The UK has shown 
that it has a significant impact on the provision of postgraduate medical education. Medical academics were requested to provide direct care. So it had an impact on the academic medical research it also, it, similarly. Standard clinical placement initially for the medical students in early stages of their courses were withdrawn due to combination of loss of routine service, redeployment of specialty staff and health concerns. They are now getting back to the previous type of teaching with a hybrid of type of teaching, but it was the initial situation. Traditional face-to-face -face group teaching were suspended. Different teaching modalities like webinars, pre-recorded videos, online resources, and practical skill sessions were used. However, medical student anxiety initially remained high, with particular concerns not about themselves, but surrounding their interaction with non-medical family members and friends. What about India? During this pandemic, most educational institutions in India have opted for online education to protect their employee and students. This initiative coincides with the recently introduced competency-based medical education in India, which has embraced online education. One Indian study narrated the use of e-learning platform improved the healthcare workers' digital skills. And 65% of these healthcare workers perceived e-learning should play a major role in minimizing the impact of pandemic on education and training system in their country. But however, some of the challenges faced by the teachers and the students include lack of technological skill, poor time management, and internet connectivity and lack of infrastructure are a very important concern. In Pakistan, medical college and universities are facing challenges to provide quality education. Similarly, like any other country, the challenges include lack of faculty training and institutional support, internet connectivity issue, maintaining student engagement, online assessment, and problems with understanding the unique dynamics of online education. One study pointed out that the certain transition from in-person teaching to a complete online delivery of educational content in a matter of days Learning without any extensive planning and faculty training produces challenges while engaging in online medical education. The adaptations have ranged from different aspects of teaching to assessment and more student engagement, development of online resource, digital clinical experience, virtual bedside teaching rounds, monitoring online conferences and faculty development initiatives. In Bangladesh, we have 112 medical colleges which are assigned to provide the formal medical education. Around 10 medical college and institutions run postgraduate course in cardiology. That is, there is diploma, there is uh, MD degree under Bangladesh Shekhmati Medical University and Dhaka University. And there is also FCPS in cardiology under BCBS. However, this pandemic has caused unprecedented disruption of medical education in Bangladesh, leading to switch to online education from conventional face-to-face -face education. However, adopting a virtual teaching is a new experience in all the medical institutes. And certain shift among teaching methodology has imposed challenges both to the faculties and the students. As of 13 June, uh, more than 800,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 are identified in the country. More than 13,000 have died. The current case positivity rate is around 14.8%. A number of national and international studies related to our COVID-19 and ongoing in the country. Currently, we are also involved in a research of World Heart Federation titled WHF Global COVID-19 and Civil Survey. Three hospitals in Bangladesh are participating in this study. What's the scenario of medical education? The challenges include close contact teaching like lecture classes, tutorials, group discussions, hands-on training, thorough clinical examination. None of them are possible. Patients are also afraid of exposure. So in-house suitable caseload is also reduced. Many teaching hospitals have become regional and local COVID-19 treatment hub. For example, in Dhaka Medical College Hospital, which is the premier medical college hospital of this country, entire cardiology department is COVID dedicated. So the teaching and training of our cardiology students who are placed there are extremely hampered. 
students and faculties alive face severe anxiety and are quite devastated because many doctors have died from COVID-19. And also, with the rotational system employed in our country, the number of available faculties and auxiliary staff are also reduced. One unpublished study, one of my students is doing thesis over there, amongst the postgraduate cardiology students, one fifth of the respondents are suffering from clinical depression with factors mostly related to this COVID-19 situation. This is a serious concern. All postgraduate trainee doctors and residents in our country are involved in COVID patient care, so they have less time to focus on hands-on training. How are you coping with it? In many institutions, virtual classes, classes are held on different cardiology topics that are accessible mainly to postgraduate trainee and residents, but also to the undergraduate students. These virtual classes are accessible to students of other institutions and medical colleges as well. So when one institution is organizing a course or a class, students from every other institution of this country can join in. National Heart Foundation Hospital, National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease, and the Cardiology Department of Bangladesh Shakmati Medical University have been arranging regular classes for more than a year. And academic organization like IPDI, Interactive Professional Development Initiative and ECG Study Group. They are organizing regular, multiple weekly virtual lectures and interactive discussions with the engagement of faculties from home and abroad since May 2020, more than a year. They have also successfully demonstrated clinical examination methods and different interventional procedures like coronary angiogram and PCI. Hybrid classes where limited in person and wider virtual attendance is ensured, it's becoming a new trend. The whole cardiology chapter or syllabus is virtually covered by theory classes and virtual training sessions. Students are getting exposure to very talented and promising young expert teachers and trainers with their coming to the capital in Dhaka, which otherwise would have never been possible. So it's very lucky one student residing in a very far corner of the country, they can get access to what we are teaching in Dhaka, in here. International experts and faculties are also regularly joining us, thereby giving our students wider exposure to international faculties. And because of the COVID uh, digital intervention, more in-depth and interactive discussions are taking place. That's very surprising. Actually, in a close contact teaching, the time limit actually ensures that interactive discussion sometimes become limited. Here, it, be, it is becoming more wider. Most lectures and virtual training sessions are also made available in YouTube and Facebook. So students are getting opportunity to revisit these lectures repeatedly. What are the limitations we are facing? We should remember the online digital sessions can never substitute close contact clinical examination. Different invasive procedures like arterial puncture or central venous line insertion or pro or pericardiosynthesis or intubation or NGG fitting tube introduction or simple catheterization. You can learn many things from the books or from the sessions of virtual learning, but unless you do it with your own hand, your learning experience is not complete. Neither it can substitute invasive procedure experiences like doing angiogram or temporary lead insertion or right or left heart catheterization, or assisting the interventional procedures like PCI or pacemaker implantation or CVD surgery cannot be done virtually. In COVID era, at a, if when if we are using the hybrid classes, at a time only limited students can be given access to these procedures with proper protection. We should remember the art of clinical examination can be best learned by in-person and supervised training. Limited patient exposure can hamper the humane experience of healing the ill. Omitab has shown very nicely the same experience and feelings in his presentation. So am I. How can we try to improve this team? We need to coordinate and collaborate in more extensive ways involving all stakeholders. Logistic supports need to be ensured. Sometimes financial support for the patient and postgraduate and resident doctors for personal protection may be needed. 
availability of the digital technology should be should be ensured with good internet connection. We need to find out alternatives and options for hands-on practice and clinical sessions. Support and capacity building for the faculties for more precise, informative, and attractive digital presentation for the students and for more interactive communication that should be given. Not all faculties are computer uh, uh, wizard. Developing the skill of students to enhance their learning with the use of technology should be kept under consideration. The same thing is true. Many students can use the technology very well. Many cannot, but we should be looking for all if we need to have a very good competent cardiologist who can take care of for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary, for your nice presentation and sharing the experience from Bangladesh, especially for uh, cardiovascular related medical education. I think that this is very important issues which uh, uh, you shared with us. I think that uh, Professor Fosto, as an academician, as a science committee chair of the World Heart Federation, uh, Prabhakaran and Amitabh can uh, 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 hear about uh, our situation, about how we can proceed further uh, for improving our medical education in cardiovascular disease. Uh, we are really open to work together uh, on the basis of uh, today's presentation uh, of Professor uh, Abdul Wadu So thank you so much. Now I'm requesting uh, Professor uh, Dhoraira's Prabhakaran, who is the World Heart Federation uh, Science Committee Chair uh, from India. And uh, he is also uh, 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 principal investigator of the World Heart Federation COVID-19 study. And he's going to talk about the technological intervention to address the health disparities, example from India. Professor Prabhakar. Thank you, uh, Dr. Talukdar. And uh, I'm very grateful for uh, uh, you for inviting me to give this talk. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought in a lot of changes. And as uh, everybody pointed out, we need to be nimble and we need to be savvy enough to adapt to the changes. So what I'm going to do is talk about some of the technologies that we're using in terms of um, health systems, healthcare, as well as in training. So when we look at uh, addressing health disparities, what, what are the things that are needed in terms of technology? First is in terms of surveillance, we need a good uh, data collection. We can use mobile uh, phones or tablets, electronic health records, biomedical sensors, which was so well elicited by my good friend, Ami. In terms of screening and diagnosis, we can look at 3D imaging, portable diagnostic equipments, portable ECG, et cetera omics and precision medicine, and a computerized risk assessment. In terms of um, management, we are looking at electronic decision support systems, pharmaceutical innovations, uh, such as drugs, biomedical devices, delivery systems, and telehealth. And there are several others, which include geographical information systems, capacity building, using online methods, learning management systems, et cetera, which um, was, uh, which was again spoken about a little bit earlier, the role of nanotechnology in robotics, drug distribution, and clinical trials. I'm not going to talk about all of these because that's going to take away a lot of time. I'm going to just give two or three specific examples in terms of point of care, point of care devices, in terms of electronic decision support system, and some of the telemedicine principles that we're using, as well as the training component. The first is we are working on low-cost interventions to improve cardiovascular disease outcomes. And what is the principle here involved? One is task shifting, where we are looking at nurses or community health workers to follow up and deliver care for patients with hypertension or diabetes. And they are paired with the electronic decision support system, which in its back end has almost 2,500 case studies and has a machine learning and AI component so that it can give a personalized management plan for patients. In addition, we work in the area of quality improvement and uh, provide training using digital technologies. So let me start off with some examples. This is a point of care device which can do 11 tests in the community. It's Wi-Fi enabled device that works on an Android platform with various sensors. 
it's uh, used by frontline uh, workers for integrated primary healthcare delivery and it has a basic uh, decision support tool to provide screening and triage for various conditions it currently does 11 tests under development includes urinary albumin creatinine ratio lipids hemoglobin a1c and creatinine yeah. uh ami was saying that many times evaluation is not done this device was evaluated in antenatal care settings in close to around um, um 100000 uh, uh, women in the state of jammu and kashmir and it's been deployed in many states of india now uh but we are moving towards using this for non communicable diseases the second uh, platform that i wanted to show is what we call as empower it's a clinical decision support system for hypertension and other cardiovascular risk factors now why do we need ml technologies for uh, because for consumers it improves convenience it enables them for active engagement in self care and it leads to greater personalization for clinician it reduces demands on their time and refocuses on the art of medicine and it has the potential to change every aspect of healthcare environment to do so while delivering better outcomes and substantially lowering costs but what is really needed is a real world clinical trial evidence to provide a road map for its implementation the innovation should be low cost and potentially scalable and sustainable we'll need, we we should be using it across the board it should be cost effective and make real differences to pp so in this uh, process we use uh, five principles one we wanted to develop an electronic decision support system second we wanted to integrate care between several chronic diseases and between chronic diseases and uh, no, uh, communicable diseases and nutrition disorders we wanted to improve quality of care in the health systems provide cardiac rehabilitation and finally provide team based care so these are several studies that we conducted in the last uh, 12 years the cars translational trial was a individual randomized trial done in india and pakistan in 11 centers the empower heart study was a demonstration project in six uh, locations in the state of himachal pradesh which is to the north of delhi the sim card trial was done at the community level in india and china the m welfare trial was again a cluster randomized uh, trial in uh, two states in india and uh, the kerala ass quick trial again was a six trial done in 64 centers involving around 21000 patients in the state of kerala the independent trial looked at integration of care between depression and diabetes so i'm not going to talk about all the details but all i'm going to show is the common principle in all these studies so the patient walks in and gets referred uh, either gets referred by a auxiliary nurse midwife or some kind of uh, health worker in the community goes to the clinic and is referred to a nurse or a care coordinator who enters the initial assessment and clinical details on the nurse portal and then gets a print out actually there is because there is uh decision support there are 2500 case studies in the back end and there is ai support the patient gets a personalized a diagnosis as well as a management plan this is printed and given to the patient who goes to the medical officer who looks at the recommended action decides to accept or rewrite the uh, prescription and then the patient comes back to the nurse or care coordinator here the nurse actually updates the data on the nurse app but also in addition provides personalized lifestyle advice which is available on the decision support system and the patient walks out with the prescription in addition there are facilities for auto texting uh, for uh, scheduling follow up so that the patient can be reminded to come back for follow up so this is the integrated pathway which we have evaluated so this has been evaluated in multiple settings in community settings in primary care secondary and tertiary care we have used multiple methods that include formative research randomized control trial and demonstration project there have been more than 20 high impact uh, publications and we have scaled this up in two states of the northeast of india and there is a national level scale up being attempted now and so we have demonstrated that this is a sustainable program we initially started with hypertension and diabetes but we are developing now programs for uh, coronary artery disease stroke chronic obstructive lung disease and even pregnancy induced hypertension and gestational diabetes so this is the whole journey which has been uh, given here we started with tertiary care because that's the gold standard of care and we wanted to see if it works so in this for example there was uh, the the roc curve between our decision support system and expert opinion was 0.84 so there was 84% concordance then we did it in community level at primary care we devised different mechanisms to study hypertension diabetes then depression alcohol and tobacco use 
Then we scaled it up in the state of Tripura and Mizoram, which are in the northeast of India. And we are attempting a national level. And there's a pilot which is being con conducted in the state of Punjab to establish referral linkages. We also assisted the WHO in creating an MPEN uh, uh, platform using our MPOWER program. And we are looking at developing a symptom-based decision support system now. Now, putting this all together, in the COVID pandemic taught us that patients cannot come to the hospital. There are several restrictions. CVD care was suffering. So we created a telemedicine platform. So in this process, what we did was we planned to upskill the, upskill the skills of health workers in providing assistant uh, telemedicine. We wanted to improve access to primary and tertiary care through trained personnel. And we wanted to improve quality of care through point of care diagnostics and electronic clinical decision support system. So what it actually does is it reduces the need for follow-up visits to health facilities. But more importantly, we are in the era talking about climate change and air pollution and so on. The footfall to the hospitals reduces. This is one of the best me mechanisms and contribution by the healthcare in terms of uh, reducing air pollution and improving climate change. So it also provides real-time monitoring and feedback mechanism that assure quality standards. So the telemedicine platform that we have developed at the Public Health Foundation of India embeds electronic health records, point of care diagnostics, electronic clinical decision support systems, and numerous state-of-art digital technologies. For example, it includes the Empower platform, which I described a little bit earlier, it, it has the point-of-care device, the Swastya Sahai. It has an AI-enabled ECG, which is called Cardio Screen, which is a very small device. And it has an electronic stethoscope because we wanted to give eyes and ears to the doctors who are sitting remotely. And it has a high-definition camera so that the doctors can actually zoom in or zoom out and see the patient. So this is how the platform looks like. I'm not going to get into the details, but I'm actually going to describe some of the features that it has. It has a general physical examination findings captured by the healthcare worker. It has a template-based history on the presenting illness, personal, past, family, and drug history. It has vitals from the visit with trends. It can give you a trend over five times. It can actually show what exactly are the changes. It can give the lab results with trend trends. It can give ECG readings and uh, can give electronic clinical decision support for diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and asthma and provide an e-prescription e and provide a prescription history and mark for follow-up visit. In addition, the doctor can remotely hear the cardiac sound or the respiratory sound by using this electronic stick. In fact, it has also got a phonocardiographic facilities because the doctor can assess what kind of murmur was being seen. So essentially, this telemedicine bridges the gap between the community technology and digital healthcare through trained personnel there's continuity of care and longitudinal health data through use of inbuilt electronic health records. It creates an innovative model for health service delivery that enhances sustainability, accessibility, and affordability of care. In addition, we are also using uh, digital technologies for training. We digitize the HEARTS package for the WHO Southeast Asia region, where we digitize the R module of the HEARTS techni technical package. Now, what is different here? We are using gamification. We are providing rewards to the people who read this. And actually, we take one patient and take the patient's life course in terms of the disease and uh, provide them uh, uh, the ways and means of managing. We also provide training module for training the healthcare workers. There's a dig deeper section, pop-ups to define terms difficult to comprehend, real-life scenarios and analytical test questions to improve practical knowledge, and so on. In addition, on scale, we are training uh, primary care physicians to take over management of hypertension. This we are doing it in collaboration with multiple uh, international partners, but we are going to develop, we are in the process of developing an online training program for management of hypertension with the American Heart Association. Finally, in terms of cardiovascular diseases, we have created a certificate course, which is also being delivered online in collaboration with the World Heart Federation, the American College of Cardiology, the uh, Population Health Research Institute at McMaster University and others. So these are some of the technologies that we have, but I think we have to be careful. What are the issues we need to address when using technologies? One, I think we have to be mindful of quality and quality control is very important. Second, we need al always to think of scalability, but most importantly, these platforms have to be interoperable. They should work on Android platform. They should work on iOS platform. They should work on desktop and any kind of platform. And our PHFI Cortex that we have developed is exactly the works of that principle. 
it should address contextual needs like what is applicable in india may not be applicable to bangladesh and so even though we have digital platforms we need to contextualize the content over there they should be easy to use and they should be inexpensive and we should cater to the privacy issues so if i had to conclude i just want to conclude with two statements technologies inherently are reductionist they go to the minutest thing uh, that is required but the solutions have to be holistic so we have to marry our technology to provide a wholesome solution for patient care uh, thank you very much for listening to my talk thank you uh, provokoron for your nice presentation and sharing your telemedicine experience uh, in india uh, i think that you know your presentation may help us uh, to take forward this technology uh, to adopt in bangladesh as uh, we have our key you know leaders uh, for cardiovascular and non communicable disease with us uh, as professor adil chaudhary already uh, uh, presented and share his experience regarding the uh, medical education now uh, uh, professor dr robed amin is going to talk with us and he is the line director and main uh, driver of our non communicable disease in bangladesh uh, and he has a uh, lots of vision uh, he really want to change the you know services we have he want to extend our research activities as well as you know promote the medical education in, at the level of quality as we expected now i am requesting professor dr robed amin line director non communicable disease program uh, director general of health service ministry of health and family welfare of bangladesh dr robed amin sir uh, thank you very much amin talga for inviting me and it was wonderful to see the first pinto dr pawakaran amita banerji who has given a wonderful talk as well as professor vadu choudhury is one of my very uh, honest teacher and the one of the best cardiologists in bangladesh uh, we are delighted to see the professor shamuni sir also with us thank you sir all for inviting me i'm not going to give you any presentation i just will be trying to say something about the issues of the technology in the cardiovascular health in lmic and i will also like to give what actually we are starting to doing in the context of bangladesh so these two things i will be try to say in a briefly now first of all uh, be based on the real life case study in our country we must consider this we should go for the digital health whatever the lower conditions of the lmic country is because in such a population of high and doing the paperwork is not going to be at all successful for considering the cardiovascular disease for any country so based on this part of the real case study in our country perspective there are actually five key focus area we must identify to key have a success on the part of digital health now firstly this is the intrinsic characteristic of the program an initiative that we have actually need to be benefited for the address of unmet needs now the program that we are causing ncdc are is critical to go for success or not is to be established that is to be seen secondly the digital health system to be developed in a health system of a country is not only the health service system there are multiple stakeholder actually there and they must be actually engaged and these stakeholders need to be trained these all the stakeholders need to be motivated to implement a new initiative because this initiative was not been there in bangladesh for long thirdly this is a very high quality technical profile issues so for any technical profile of the initiative it should be driven in such a way that it is simple it is interoperable and it is adaptable now this is the problem because many of the digital system in advanced country are not simple to be used by our simple people and sometimes it's a it's a classy one but it's not interoperability is there and we also need to adaptability in the context of bangladesh as well as many lmic country so this is very important according to me another focus area that me is a policy environment are we actually in an environment of digital health initiative is intent to function properly or not i am afraid bangladesh is not in a state that what provokar has been showing very nicely that policy environment is not been actually fully completely digitalized although our government is uh, trying to focus on the part of digitalization for the last few years so what we need is to have a broader healthcare policy 
to came up uh, to make these things so different stakeholder works through it. This is one important issue. Finally, you will be agreed with me about the extrinsic ecosystem, which should also be considered, including the presence of appropriate infrastructure that we needed for a good digital initiative if you want to make it a scale up. You all be saying that there are many things to be improved to start for the digital health project maturity. One is to get a good assessment for long version of the view. Second thing is to make a good plan. And thirdly, then you can make an improvement. We do not have any maps or tool in our mind for the digital health system for cardiovascular system uh, to develop the cardiovascular initiative. That's because it needs an extensive groundwork. We did not have an extensive groundwork done, which has been done in many countries. We need a, a good amount of financial help, and it should be sustainable, not only con inclusively by means of public, it should be also private. And then the technology, architecture, the operational side, monitoring evaluation, as well as partnership. So we, we need to have a complete map tool in our mind if we want to really make a digital health of cardiovascular system to develop in Bangladesh that we are actually lacking. Now the thing is that what has been said by Prabhakar is the scalability and sustainability. I completely agree with him. But for any scalability and sustainability of a country, cardiovascular system digitalization, there are five tools. One thing is the human factors. We are not still completely sure how many human factors can be involved to improve this one. There are technical factors, healthcare ecosystem there, extensive ecosystem is there, also program characteristics. So these are five important factors which need to be workshop uh, to have a good amount of scalability in our country if you want to do real digital health system for the cardiovascular system. Now what I want to share that what actually we are doing is far behind of what Prabhakar and Dharia are shown in India. But we have started. Now, for your information, what I like to mention that our health system, our infrastructure is far better than any other LMI second in the Southeast Asia region. Why? Because we had a primary healthcare system, which is very close to the part of very rural territory in the community. In the community, there is a, for every 6,000 population, we have a community clinic. Beside this, for around 10,000 population, we have a union sub-center. These all are providing the primary health care, including the cardiovascular system. Now, another territory is called the Upajala Health Complex, which is not very distant away from the uh, community of our country, is also providing the primary health care system in a comprehensive way where there are many consultants are there, there are physicians are there. Now, the community clinic, which has been very close up to the part of the community, is not providing any doctor or physician, but we have their worker there who are known as the community health care provider. Now, these community health care providers are very key right now as because they are very close to the part of the uh, community people. And lastly, the health care provider in the form of health assistant and assistant health inspector, these people are going to the home and home where they go for a meeting uh, for the promotion and prevention of many disease activities. What we are having actually from the NCDC program is right now, try to make this thing digitalization as because when the home meeting is done by this of healthcare provider, we are providing them a unique ID system through our MIS of the digital system. When they get a card of this MIS system, we are saying that adult population more than 40 years will be coming to the community clinic to measure their blood pressure through a digital blood pressure machine and also taking the blood glucose in a sugar in a particular day. So on the two or three days in a week, they come to the community clinic to measure their blood pressure through the digital blood pressure by which of CS or community healthcare provider and also the measure in the sugar. Uh, we are providing him or her one tab actually where every system or the demography including their uh, screening part has been done. After that, they actually transfer this patient to the Upajala Health Complex, which is a little bit away from their community on a particular day because we set up an NCD corner in these Upajala Health Complexes. Now, that NCD corner is composed of usually a nurse as well as one para-health professional 
in the form of we say a SACMO or maybe a pharmacist, but not also by physician because the physicians in the Upajala Health Complex is very busy uh, because he's seeing a lot of patients over there. Within a short period of time, had to hundreds of patients to be seen. So that NCD corner nurse is having also another tab. When he, she received the patients of hypertension or any cardiovascular or any di diabetes suspected screening patient from the community clinic, he do the rest of the activity of registration. He do the rest of the activity of inclusion and also send the patient to the doctor for making a diagnosis and management. After that, this system of digitization put them in the drugs and, uh, to, uh, and advise him to take the drug for one month and then come back again to this Upujala Health Complex or community clinic for refilling of the drug. So this is how up to the amount of digitalization system we are working in only 70 Upujala of Bangladesh. Currently, we have 492 Upujala, so we had to go a lot to cover in the, first, in the next few years. Uh, as because we saw that when this system of MIS through the tab or any simple app system is carried out, the enrollment of the patient is very high. The, the follow-up is also very high and patient becomes encouraged to come because they are getting the medicine free. Now, what we need is to proper referral system from this Upujala Health Complex to a secondary care or a tertiary care that we actually doesn't exist right now. So what we are planning is to make a hub within the district or medical college and make the spokes in the Upajala health complexes uh, to carry out at least the hypertension or diabetes in the digitalized platform uh, so that we can have a very good amount of surveillance system in our country. So you see, we are just uh, still uh, the process is in the preliminary stage. We do not go for the complete cardiovascular risk assessment and through the different digital platforms that's been shown very nicely by Dr. Prabhakaran, but uh, I'm impressed by to seeing her one simple machines that is uh, inclusions of the 12 or many system, uh, including the human physiology and other part, which is uh, wonderful to see actually, and also the uh, digital system of the, you know, the cameras and other things that have been shown. Uh, we have a very good telehealth service, I would say. In this COVID-19, uh, we saw that it works wonderfully because millions of people actually take the care of the telehealth. But the concept of telemedicine, which has not been there in Bangladesh, is now in the primer move only. We have a national guideline that has been established in the last year. And currently this year, with the regulatory process is going on to completion of this guideline of telemedicine services in Bangladesh. Because we see that this is a big project, a big prospect of digitalization health in Bangladesh, especially for the consider we consider about the cardiovascular system. So you see our limitation is obviously there, but we started and uh, we are hopeful that after uh, watching you and listening from many of the stakeholders, we can proceed on to our activity of the digital health system and the cardiovascular system in our country. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Rubin sir, for sharing the uh, health infrastructure of Bangladesh and the initiative uh, government has taken. Uh, to digitalization um, of the non-communicable disease-related healthcare service up to the community clinic level. I think that uh, this, uh, your uh, you know, point of discussion give us a uh, overview that how Bangladesh is moving forward, uh, especially for taking care of the non-communicable disease. Uh, now, uh, as per you know, our scheduled time, we are at the end of our program. Uh, we'll here from our two co-chairs, Professor Shamunarishan and Professor Fausto Pinto, uh, regarding their uh, you know, uh, concluding remarks. First of all, I like to request Professor Shamunarishan to give his uh, 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 concluding remarks and way forward of this webinar. Professor Shamunarishan, sir, unmute Korean. Thank you, Shamim. I was listening very carefully, very carefully. And the wonderful presentations given by five, five or four? Four. Four, yes. Uh, four, four presentations, was wonderful presentations on the digital additions of medical services. 
I was just uh, when they were talking, I could remember I could see sometimes in our television, Bangladesh television channels, some of the channels, there is an emotion touching advertisement. The advertisement is that one young lady is trying to get his planning from online in a very rural setup where the connectivity was challenged and also how she will be connected and how she will press his mobile phone. And her grandfather was cutting some bamboo and prepared a wonderful bamboo set to set his uh, uh, this uh, uh, mobile phone so that she can really learn online uh, very steadily. That's mean where we have come with these COVID challenges uh, that has given an opportunity to increase the digitalization process in learning, teaching, as well as providing service to the patient. So all of these four presentations, and of course, the Dr. Amitabh Banerjee has nicely explained hope or hype, yes, of the digital health interactions. And, and she has played, nicely played, presented his presentations, how to move from science to evidence to care. So of course, and that has given the, that will give opportunities for getting the quality care by the, uh, by providing the evidence-based science. So this is one, one aspect and, and, and the, the uh, his area of providing services is a little different from ours, but still uh, we can learn a lot from him because there will be a lot of challenges, particularly he mentioned about the cost effectiveness. This is very important because cost effectiveness will be another big challenge. And another important big challenge is as I always assume that does the patient satisfaction is we are covering in providing the digital health. Sometimes uh, the patient satisfaction is really challenged. So we have to take care of that, how that can be done. So that is very important. Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury has raised a very important issue of teaching medicine through digital process. Uh, clinical teaching by digital process is, is really is, is challenging. There is no doubt it, it is challenges because uh, uh, without the face-to-face -face teaching, without the physical examinations, uh, the teaching cardiology, uh, of course, I'm sure we are teaching now, but I'm sure the quality, effectiveness, and also the and adjunction, not a adjunction of the learning by the students, all will is challenged. So, you know, there are opportunities, there are challenges as more. Opportunities, he has mentioned very rightly that opportunities there because access to the very highly qualified teachers from a very uh, distance area uh, through this digital process is there. But the challenges are more, challenges are more. So uh, the, this pandemic has teaches us how to overcome the, those challenges in pandemic, but it's still medical education in particularly, um, I, I'm sure in Bangladesh, I, I used to talk quite a lot with, with my the education ministers, how to overcome the medical education system and, and really, I don't know how this will be done, but the uh, digital learning is giving some opportunity, but there is a lot of challenges. Professor Prabhakar has, was talking on the technology innovations about this health uh, and about the health disparities. And, and most, most importantly, he mentioned that, that uh, this new technique, or of course the, the artificial intelligence through this new technique 
may be a low cost for screening the patients initially, but uh, the screening is good. But the quality, can you ensure the quality? That is another, another uh, big challenge is that you have to think very seriously that quality. But anyhow, uh, the, in his conclusion, he said that solution have to be holistic. And of course, we must have a holistic way of, of solving this. So, Shasta Shayab is in good tools. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, again, I must say that we have to see that the surveillance, we have to do the surveillance that how effective really it is for not for the only diagnosis, but for the managing as an overall uh, management of the diseases. So empower uh, your heart and empower health system evolutions. And of course, in, in India, uh, you have a very strong technological background. And with this technical background, and I'm sure uh, we, we you can go ahead with this. But again, and there, there will be challenges as as Professor Robert Amin has mentioned that the five keys about this five keys area. So again, this question of high quality and success of digital health is now the people are taking it. There is lot of telemedicines uh, activities are provided. Uh, but if you if you ask the patients that. Uh, are you sure the, your, your satisfaction level is quite up to the level for getting these services? Uh, there was a survey and the, the report was not up to that satisfactory level. So again, the, but, but, but we have to do it. But we have to do it. This is, there is no other alternative in this pandemic area situations. Initially, in, in the early 20, when this pandemic started in the, in the month of March in Bangladesh, uh, there was huge hue and cry about this availability and access to the uh, non-COVID uh, patient's care. And so the, the people, even, even there was a report that people are running from one clinic to one clinic, one hospital to one hospital to get the services and they could not get the services because the availability was challenged. But we have overcome that. Now digitalization has given us the opportunity to overcome it. And also uh, the other systems has uh, gives us the opportunity to work on it. So that's very important. And uh, that we the adaptations is very important. We could adapt to these situations and uh, we, with this adaptations policy, uh, I think uh, our digitalization uh, will give the opportunity to extend the services at the all level. And finally, I must recall the Professor Robert Amin and, uh, and informations are about this primary healthcare system in Bangladesh, and and of course piloting those uh, the uh, digital screening for uh, not cardiac disease, I should say hypertensions and diabetes, starting from the very grassroots level up to the secondary level hospital, and of course as he mentioned very rightly that we could not develop a strong. You know, referral systems after the tertiary level hospitals, but we need to scale up it. Um, we need to scale up it, and of course that will give us the opportunity to, if you really can scale up um, uh, and cover all these upajalas of the country, uh, that will be very helpful for the patients. So with this uh, word, I must again thanks everybody, all the speakers, for their wonderful presentations. And, and the knowledge sharing presentations. I, I personally learned a lot from your presentations. And finally, I must thank uh, the Eminence and World Heart Foundations for organizing this uh, webinar, uh, for exchanging the views. Uh, no, 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 and of course, our uh, viewer will be benefited through this. And my final thanks to my co-chair, uh, of course, uh, for uh, Professor Pinto, you know, for, for being with us. And thank you, Professor Shami, for organizing this. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Professor Shamrishan, for your nice uh, uh, concluding remarks. Now our final 
uh, uh, speaker to say uh, concluding remarks on behalf of World Heart Federation, uh, Professor Fausto Pinto, President of the World Heart Federation and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Lisbon. Professor uh, Fausto Pinto, for your final concluding remarks as a way forward and how we can move uh, to develop a strong partnership with uh, Bangladesh. Well, thank you so much. And uh, again, congratulations uh, for the organization of this webinar. Uh, we had uh, four wonderful lectures and we just had very uh, important uh, remarks uh, by my co-chair. Um, I, um, I would try to be brief. I'm aware of we're a little bit over time, but uh, I would say uh, two major points. One, regarding digital health. I think it's uh, obvious today that uh, uh, if there is anything that the pandemic was uh, uh, had some positive uh, uh, consequences has been the ability to push forward very fast the development of uh, te technology and the development of implementation of digital technology, including uh, in health. And that was, let's say, one of the positive aspects and in all different aspects, not only for medical practice, for teaching, for remote uh, communication. So it's really been one of, I would say, the, the, the main uh, fast developments in humankind for the last uh, centuries, I would say, or at least years, uh, was the development of digital technologies. And uh, in this case, we focus a little bit on medical uh, applications of, this, uh, of these technologies. And I think that's going to be something that it's here to stay and it's going to be, and we just had beautiful examples. Uh, Dr. Prabhaka showed beautiful examples in India and also I understand that you are also developing in Bangladesh. We're developing in, here in Europe. In other parts of the world, it's really been uh, quite interesting to follow some of the new applications and how that can help us to do better medical practice. But there is an important element, and one of the elements that we should not forget, and particularly we as medical uh, leaders, uh, it's about not forgetting the human part of medicine. You know, the, the humanity that is behind all our gestures, uh, all our practices should not be forgotten and we have to continue to implement and to convey these messages to our students, to our fellows, to our followers, because we are dealing, of course, with, uh, with, the, 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 uh, with humans and we are dealing with disease. Uh, we are also promoting healthy lifestyles and working with the community, but particularly when dealing with, uh, uh, with patients, with disease, we should not forget, and there was mentioned by some of you, the relevance of keeping the humanity behind the medical gestures uh, as an important component that should never be forgotten. And, uh, and that's actually one of, uh, and it was shown also, it's one of the downsides, or at least one of the potential limitations of digital technology, in particular remote uh, consultations and telehealth and so on is the lack of human uh, interface and the, the, the human touch that has to be, of course, present when we are dealing with our patients. So that's something just to keep in mind because uh, uh, sometimes we are so fascinated with technology, but we should not forget that we are dealing with uh, human beings, we are dealing with our populations, with our patients, and it's important not to forget that. And my second uh, aspect is focusing on medical education. You know, I've been very much involved uh, here in my medical school, but also uh, interfacing with other universities and other medical schools. There was a very nice presentation uh, that uh, uh, was, uh, uh, was, was very clear on uh, uh, some of the aspects related with the implications of the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic on medical education. And that's another important message, is that despite the fact that we are living and we live through this pandemic, we should not forget that it's our responsibility to assure, to guarantee medical education for the next generations. And that was something that we very much focused here. You know, on the first stages of the pandemic, of course, we also had to send our students home and so on. But then we had also to take the opportunity, it's a unique opportunity also to teach our students, to teach our fellows in an environment that none of us has ever lived. You know, the last pandemic was a hundred years ago. So we also tried to incorporate medical education, medical teaching, uh, 
uh, uh, with our students and to ensure that they had some contact with this and had taken some advantages of this experience with also this, uh, this, this, this condition on one hand. And on the other hand, uh, and that was also highlighted by some of you, the need that to, to, to do medical, proper medical training, you need to be with the patient. Even if we have and we're using, and that's another thing that had a lot of developments, new platforms, digital platforms, uh, 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 simulation models, you know, we're using all of that, but still we have to ensure, and that's a challenge, we have to ensure that uh, we uh, have to do practical teaching of our students uh, with the patients. And that was actually one of the big challenges that we had to face, how to organize that, which in a way helped us to restructure our, uh, the way that we were doing teaching and maybe in some cases for the better, you know, smaller groups, uh, more dedicated uh, uh, teachers. So there, there were actually some benef benefits taken from, uh, from this pandemic that may help to improve the way that uh, we are doing medical education. But uh, I would just like to conclude by saying that uh, uh, we at WHF, we very much encourage uh, this type of uh, discussions. We encourage this type of exchanges. We're very much supportive of the initiatives that uh, will uh, undergo uh, by our members and, uh, and by our colleagues, by our partners. And we're very much willing to do our best to continue to support you and to continue to work together so we can do better uh, on one hand, better patient management, on the other hand, do better prevention and uh, achieve what I mentioned at the beginning, kind of ask for help for everyone. So thank you very much to Eminence. Thank you very much to all the speakers and uh, all the colleagues that were watching uh, this uh, webinar remotely. And uh, what I just wish is that very soon to be there in Bangladesh. I would love to come and, uh, and be uh, in the field, face-to-face uh, -face discussing this, uh, uh, these topics, which are very important for all of us. So thank you so much and looking forward to our continuous collaboration and to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Foster. Before I uh, uh, close the session, I should uh, uh, give the thanks uh, to uh, Andrea Dragas from World Heart Federation, uh, Farahin Sultana from Eminence, Dr. Sahar Raja, Dr. Shaheen Akhtar, uh, 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 Johirul Islam, uh, Mustafa Zawon Tushar for their hard work. Uh, uh, moreover, uh, Lucia uh, Bascardini, uh, Jimmy Shiju uh, for supporting us, as well as uh, Public Health Foundation of India uh, uh, to organize this web webinar. Uh, finally, uh, from Eminence and Bangladesh Non-Communicable Disease Forum, uh, uh, we like to thank uh, Professor Shamunarishan, Professor Abdul Odil Choudhury, uh, Professor Dr. Robert Amin, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Amita Banerjee, Professor uh, Dorarji Prabhakaran, and uh, Professor Fusto Pinto for giving us this time. We hope to work together soon. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>